You're listening to episode 61 of the Confident Writer podcast with Jane Pike. Hello, fabulous human. It is so super lovely to be back with you. I'm a little bit husky. My voice is a little bit croaky, but I'm going to go with the fact that it's kind of like endearing in some way that you're like, wow, how's Jane changed up her voice like that? (laughs) When the reality is I've had some kind of flu weird thing for the last month, actually, that's just kind of like (laughs) hit me between the eyes, like oof, and I um, completely lost my voice for a couple of weeks, which was not ideal by any stretch. I actually realized my entire business is my voice, essentially. (laughs) So um, I considered when I was at the very squeaky phase, recording a couple of episodes, but listening to myself back, I was like, yeah, nobody really wants that in their earbuds, you know, (laughs) nobody really wants to be listening to that. So I apologize for the consistently inconsistent episodes of the podcast the last month. I would love to be that person. You know what? I'm going to be that person moving forward that pre-records a whole bunch of episodes and has them waiting in the wings. So when something unplanned comes up like this, you're like, you know what? I've got this. I can sit back on my massive deck chair and relax with my pina colada and Those episodes are going to keep rolling out instead of little old me scrabbling in the background thinking, oh my goodness, how can you record something audio based when you don't have a voice? I can't even improvisational dance to it. So yeah, anyway, this is the the best of the worst at the moment. This is the, um, the voice level that allows us to have communication and we're going to roll with that. So <laughs> potentially the slightly nasal tones will be, uh, what do you call it, sort of exacerbating or exaggerating my natural Australian slash New Zealand inflection. So um, we'll see how that goes and if it causes audible offence, I understand, and I (laughs) apologise. You know, actually, when I was working overseas, I was um, in Europe for a really long time, and this is like my past life I'm talking about. So like for a decade there, I was working in emergency aid relief. I think I've bored you with the details of that in a different podcast. And I'd been in Europe for an extended period of time, listening, of course, to all of the amazing accents and convincing myself that I too sounded that delicious. And then I jumped back on a Qantas flight, no offense to Qantas, but I jumped back on a Qantas flight back to Australia at that point. And one of the air hostesses, um, is that the word you use these days? I'm not sure. Anyway, you know, she came and gave me whatever it is that she was giving me and her Australian accent boomed in my ears And it was kind of really like this. And I was like, oh my goodness, like, is that how I sound to the rest of the world? I thought I was sitting somewhere between French and Italian. That's where my subconscious mind had taken me. I was like, yes, this is how she sounds. This is how you sound, Jane. This is the dream. When actually, when I was confronted with the reality, I was like, hmm some work to do. So (laughs) a completely non-related story for you there. The other thing I want to say, which seems kind of odd to couple after the story that we haven't been around for a while, is that we clicked over 100,000 downloads just a couple of days ago. And I'm actually not a stats person. I really don't look at the stats very often, but because I hadn't been on my little back end of the podcast website for a significant period of time. I was kind of poking around and thinking about what to record for the next episode and I clicked on the stats and and I kid you not, like when I clicked on it, it was 99,999 and I was like, oh my goodness, like what are the chances? And so I sent out the word, I was like, who wants to click it over to 100,000? And some beautiful people who downloaded the podcast or streamed it because I think they count as the same thing and and we clicked over. So that's so exciting. I really want to say thank you so much. When I started out doing the podcast, it gave me hot sweats and I remember I was trying so many different places around the room to record the episodes in like, does it sound better here? Can I be more natural and relaxed over here? And when I listen back, like even when I go back to the first episode, I feel like I sound quite wooden compared to now. And that's because 
I don't know, like it's really, it's weird when you start out doing something. And I know that potentially a lot of you, you might not be working in the equestrian space, but many of you have your own businesses. Some of you are required to put yourself out there in ways that aren't necessarily the natural modus operandi for you. And I totally get that. Like when I first started out and was doing video, I watched someone else do videos in their <laughs> in their business. And I was like, I think I need to do video. And I forced myself to do one video a week. This is years ago. And it used to give me hot sweats. I remember that. And it also, when I went to post it, I was like, ah, this is really not the thing that comes naturally. And so I'd got myself over that hurdle. And now I'm super comfortable with video. Like I can press record. It's totally no sweat. I feel like I'm myself behind the screen now. Whereas before it was like you watched it back and you're like, who is that person that's talking? They seem like they're sitting on something uncomfortable. They're very rigid. <laughs> And I think when I first started the podcast, it was kind of like that. It's strange in the beginning because when you hit record on your little microphone, you're just sitting by yourself essentially, unless you're doing a, an interview, talking in the room. And there's it's very unnatural because you've got no feedback mechanism in terms of relating to someone or chatting to someone. And I found that kind of tough to start with. But now as this whole podcast journey has evolved – and I've been loving it. Like, truthfully, it's my favorite thing to do now. I have such a sense of you all that I'm talking to and the feedback that I've got. And when I see the reviews pop up, honestly, it really makes my day. So thank you so, so, so much. It really, I'm kind of blown away that it's got to this stage that little old me in the big world of the horsing arena has, you know, got out there to the point where enough of you have downloaded it to make it a thing. So I'm really appreciative. And like I say, genuinely shocked, but I'm um, stoked at the same time. So awesome. All right. On to the actual topic that we're going to talk about today, which is not what I planned in the beginning, but when I lost my voice, I posted in my Joyride Facebook group, I was like, dudes, okay, I really want to record an episode. Obviously, I have no voice, but I'm thinking maybe I could do like little snippets of answers, like a speed coaching, speed podcast style episode. And they gave me lots of questions that potentially I could use to sort of like fire off some quick fire replies. And I was going to use them for this episode, but then I wrote a couple of Facebook posts over the course of last week that really hit the spot for a lot of people. And what interested me about those posts was, I feel like I've been talking about that all along. But what is actually happening in my mind and what it is I'm communicating <laughs> sometimes are two different things, meaning that I get really into the detail. I love the the reasons behind and the nervous system understanding and I get completely in my own brain space, how that matches up to our writing life. But sometimes I don't think I'm explicit enough or clear enough in how those two things link together. And this post really showed me that that was the case in this instance. So what we're going to talk about today is capacity, nervous system capacity, and we're going to relate it to wanting to canter. Or perhaps a better way of saying that is when you are in a situation where you're actually afraid to canter. Now, this may not relate to you at all, or you might be putting your hand up and going, oh my goodness, that is so me. I have such a thing with canter. So what I want you to appreciate about this discussion, if you can, is the principles behind it. And you can extrapolate it to any situation where you feel that you have some kind of concern or fear arising in your body in response to the energy that your horse is presenting. So this conversation, I'm going to use being afraid to canter as an example, but it absolutely can apply to any situation where there is that coupling together. So let me take you back to when I first had this realization that something was going on in this way. And it was prior to me doing the work that I'm doing now. So I was still in this same area, but as if you've been with me for a little while, you know, over the last kind of year or two, there's been a really big evolution away from probably what I would describe as explicitly mindset, mental skills work, 
and much more of an incorporation now with ultimately what hits me in the heartstrings and that is um, somatic work. So incorporating the body, incorporating nervous system awareness and, and fusing that together with the mindset stuff. I now know that those two things are impossible to separate out. And I think, you know, I always knew that in my guts, but it had to follow its own adventure. Hey, it had to follow its own process to show up in my life in a way that made me feel like I was articulate enough and had a grounding and an understanding in it enough to be able to share what I knew with other people, which is where I'm hopefully at at the moment. So way back when I was doing a clinic in person and someone was working, I was working with someone with their horse on the ground and their horse was pretty much flatlining. <laughs> and what I mean by that is there was nothing going on in terms of a big behavioral issue. Nothing was out of control. There wasn't like anything that you could pinpoint that was kind of like, whoa, that's big, you know, like we have to be really careful of this. And the person that I was working with was incredibly nervous. So we've got this presentation of someone in the arena that's very nervous, very unsure, full of worry and doubt, and a horse that's kind of ticking around. Perhaps if we really were to dissect it a little bit, tuned out themselves kind of that through boredom or dissociation or whatever it is that um, we would pinpoint in that area. But when I worked with that horse on the ground just to demonstrate some different levels of intention and energy and activation in my own body, the I watched the other person at different moments and it was like the bigger their horse became, even though that bigness wasn't problematic, quote unquote, the smaller the handler became, the smaller the rider became. And it was like these two polarities that pinged against each other where when there was an energetic projection in one half of the partnership and that was demonstrated through Kanta in this instance, the way that that showed up in the body of the, other per of the handler or the rider was to make themselves as small as possible. Now, this wasn't a conscious response, right? So this wasn't the rider or the horse person thinking something. This was a physical response to a presentation of energy that the person was simply unable to hold in their system. So the reflexive, what do you call it? I've, along with my voice, I've lost some of my brain cells. The reflexive response of the rider was to minimize themselves, right? So I see this all of the time. When we're talking about capacity, we're talking about your ability to hold a certain amount of energetic resonance in your body. It's not necessarily about going faster. It's not about the canter. It's just on the energetic continuum, the horse has reached a different level of activation necessary for that particular movement to be undertaken. And the feeling of that in the body of the rider is beyond their capacity to hold it within the edges of their skin. So as soon as the energy gets bigger than your body, as soon as the emotional experience gets bigger than your body, you move into whatever default response is most familiar to you. And when I'm, when I'm talking about a default response, I'm talking about moving into fight, flight or freeze. So in this instance, the person went into freeze. That was their thing. So at the time, I didn't have the knowledge or the education or the understanding that I do now. But I got it. I got that that energetic association was unable to be held. And... Once I kind of clicked into that understanding, I went on more of a mission to really get how it is that we can become comfortable with that experience. Now, what I see or how I see those types of experiences being tended to in the mainstream, if you like, and this is definitely not a critique or a criticism of any one particular person's work at all. It's just like a general observation. And certainly how I used to approach it in the past as well 
is about trying to change the situation at the level of thought. So to be like, okay, you know, get on and think positive, think about it going well, yada, 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 yada. But this isn't happening at a mental level. This is happening at a physical level. Literally the capacity of that person's nervous system to hold a level of activation in the body is being overwhelmed. And as a consequence, the body is doing or the nervous system is responding in the way that it deems appropriate to keep the person safe in that moment. Now, what we understand about that is that's really not useful to us when we're out there riding, right? Like we don't want to be moving into these areas of operation where we're no longer in control of our own agency. So being in control of our own agency means that while I am in this zone, I'm still able to A, recognize what's happening inside my body and B, choose where it is I want to direct the energy. So over the last little while, I've been working on the final couple of pathways for Joyride and the activation pathway is all about intentionally increasing our capacity for sympathetic charge. And this is exactly what it is that I'm talking about. When we have the bigger powers or the bigger energies with our horses, and for some of us, we're not even going to get as far as canter before that happens. This can happen even when you're on the ground, you know, like this doesn't even have to be an experience in the saddle. And actually, the example that I talked to you about just now happened to someone while they were on the ground. I watched that shrinking in their body when they actually just visually connected with the experience of their horse cantering. So you can imagine the limitations that arise when they're actually connected physically as an experience of horse and rider. So it's all about how is it that we can increase our capacity to hold that resonance, to hold that energetic charge in our body without moving into a survival response. And many of us, we don't have the skills and the resources to be able to ground and center in the midst of that discomfort so that we can allow that experience to be transformative. And instead, we move quickly away from it because it feels uncomfortable. And we've also fused together or what I call coupled together the idea of being physically, sorry, being actually under threat or in peril with that degree of sensation and feeling in the body. So the work then is to regulate in the first instance, because in my experience, when we are already sitting in a place of hypervigilance, our baseline is so close to threshold already that it takes very little to tip us over the edge. So we're already up the chain. You know, if we think about things existing on an emotional energetic continuum, we're already quite close to the point where we're about to flip our lids or feel like the experience has got bigger than our body. And so we have such a minimal opportunity. You know, we have such a minimal threshold of opportunity to sit with that experience because we're already so close to being out of the zone of I've got this. Resources are so, so important, but ultimately what everything is about and what the Activate Pathway in Joyride is about as well is about, it's not really about the emotional experience per se, it's about being able to manage the physiology of the emotional experience. So as soon as I'm in touch with that sensation, that I have the skills and the ability to ground within that and to not feel like that level of energy is going to take me to a place where I'm no longer in control of what it is that I am putting out there or where it is I'm directing the energy. So that was kind of the crux of that Facebook post. And a lot of people resonated with that and were like, yeah, that's my thing. Like I just, I I can't deal with the canter and it's so frustrating. And I can, I have this understanding when I look at my horse or I'm riding that I'm safe, right? So that's, this is a prerequisite as well. When I'm having these discussions, there are layers, right? There are layers to this. So first and foremost, your body is always going to prioritize being safe naturally, right? So if you're actually in an unsafe position, 
if your horse is demonstrating a degree of power that you can't handle, that you, there is a behavioral issue that perhaps is something that needs to be concurrently dealt with, then the information that you're getting back from your nervous system is one that you need to pay attention to. So I'm not advocating ignoring the signals of your body when they're valid. But what this is demonstrating is in the situations where safety and competency is not necessarily a concern, then we need to understand that there are these pre-patterned responses in our nervous system in conjunction or in reaction to an energetic resonance that's coming from the outside that is causing us to create a story that tells us we are really unsafe. And when we have that story come up in our mind, it magnifies or exaggerates the experience. And pretty soon we get into a situation where any amount of activation or kind of like uprising in the body automatically makes us feel like we just want to get out of there. So it's a fascination to me, but it's also really possible to undo and unpack. It just requires some gentle gloves, you know, and this is the way that I love to approach things too. I'm really not about making things hard. Like the healing process or the integration process is actually a beautiful one. And it's one about finding the pockets of ease as much as it is about learning to ground in the discomfort. In fact, it's more about finding the pockets of ease. It's more about how can we magnify the good feeling? You know, how is it that we can rest in the spaciousness and not always be swallowed by the contraction? So that's really, really important if you're afraid or kind of thinking, you know what, I'd love to do this kind of work, but I'm not sure I'm ready to dive into that area because it just sounds too hard or I'm scared about what comes up. Don't be because it's a liberation. And like I say, we're actually looking for the ease. Yeah, sure. There's going to be moments of discomfort, but you're already in them, right? <laughs> like if you're already thinking about doing this stuff, it'll be motivated by something that you want to have less of. So you're already in that discomfort. Now we're actually saying, all right, well, let's, let's intentionally work with that so we can cultivate some better feeling places and recognize the ability for two things to coexist at the same time. So something can be really hard at the same time as you can find ease or enjoyment in a situation. Those two things aren't mutually exclusive. And so multitasking our awareness is, is a huge skill in really being able to deal with things that we might typically understand as being challenging or uncomfortable. So what I want to throw in here as the next little piece is the, a concept that some of you may have heard before, um, and I've been going down the rabbit hole of this as well. Joyriders, if you're listening to me, All of this, if you're listening to me, I sound like I was sending out an SOS message, hey, but if you are in Joyride and you're like, oh, what is she talking about? The Activate Pathway, go into there. We go into this stuff in a lot of detail. So um, there's a really progressive process for you to go through. Of course, do the stuff that comes before because that's like the grounding work that'll give you the skills to be able to handle this activation without sending you into those responses. But you know that. And slow flying bird, right? That's the the catchphrase that I use for joyride all the time. It's like we have to move through the material at the speed of a slow flying bird so that we don't overwhelm ourselves, so that it's an integration and so that we're actually honoring what it is that's showing up in our body and making sure that we're not overriding that with this intellectual feeling of where we should be at whatever time we think that should be. So relaxation and induced anxiety. This is another thing that gets in people's way around conversations of capacity or being able to kind of hold bigger energies and relaxation and induced anxiety is the reflexive or rebound reaction of anxiety to any kind of settling or release in the body. You may be familiar with this. You may see it in your horses as well when we are set in the mode of hypervigilance. So when we know that we're operating in that place where we're kind of go, go, go. We're always moving with the hamster wheel on the inside and feeling like there's a, you know, we're almost buzzing on the outside. Any feeling of opening or release or letdown feels very unsafe. And it takes us back to the discussion of tension as well, which is what is the purpose of holding tension? What is the purpose of holding contraction in the body? And the purpose is protective, right? So if you think about 
anything you hold tight, anything you've clasped your hands around literally and metaphorically, the reason is that for that is to create a sense of containment. And the release then has to be a better option, right? It has to feel like there's some kind of gain for you to let go. And the ultimate need for relaxation to occur, the kind of like steps that need to be ticked off, is first you need to be safe to be able to do that. And secondly, it, you need to feel like the energy is going to be contained. So if you think about holding on to tension, be that mental tension, emotional tension or physical tension, the reason you hold on to that is because that feels like the necessary thing to do, right? Your body is never trying to work against you. It feels like for whatever reason, that was needed in the moment to hold on to that tension. And so releasing it, falling into the safety net, you have to feel like the safety net's there and you have to feel like whatever it is that's going to come up is going to be held, you know, is going to be caught. So this is a huge part of it too. In as much as we have to give ourselves the resources to be able to deal with what we would understand as being the difficult, the challenging or the uncomfortable, we also have to increase our capacity to rest in the good stuff, to actually allow ourselves that opening and release, to actually feel like relaxation is possible for us, to actually allow ourselves to rest in good feeling without automatically feeling like there's some kind of foreboding event that's going to happen off the back of that or it's going to preempt something else that we don't want. And ultimately, it comes from feeling like there's a lack of control. We convince ourselves that holding on tightly to something and not letting go, be that our life, be that, you know, helicoptering around our children or ourselves, be that micromanaging everything that our horses do, gives us a semblance of control that means we are somehow also in control of future outcomes. But we know ultimately that's not the case, you know. So this illusion of control, of holding on, means that we never let ourselves rest. We never let ourselves move into ease. And in many instances, it doesn't even feel like it's available to us. So this is part of it as well. Restoring that nervous system balance, cultivating a feeling of safety in the body, the mind and the heart, and uncoupling this nervous system feeling, the sensation, what it is that comes up in the body from an automatic association mentally with feelings of lack of safety or concern. It's pretty beautiful work. I don't know what else I would rather be doing, to be fair. <laughs> and I see it working. That's the other beautiful thing. Like I know, I know the exasperation on one hand and the despondency that can come from feeling like you're at war with yourself in these situations. And so if that's you, Gently hold yourself, give yourself a hug and say, this was just the best efforts of your body to keep you safe. Nothing to be ashamed about. It's just now, once you have a recognition of what it is that's going on, then you can make a decision about how it is you want to move forward. You can give yourself resources. You can learn about how it is you can increase your nervous system capacity. You can approach things in a different way to allow for a different experience. And that is what the journey and the adventure is all about. So thank you for joining me today. Thank you for <laughs> bumbling through with me with my croakiness. I hope you got something out of this and I'm super keen. If you've got any questions or thoughts, shoot them through to me. You can email me, jane at confidentrider.online. The work in Joyride is really just geared all around this, guys. So if you're wanting to get on board with what it is that I'm talking about, hit me up. You can go to my website, confidentrider.online forward slash joyride and have a read. See if it hits the spot for you. And you can always get in touch if there's anything you'd like to chat about. All right, team. It's fabulous to be back in the fold. Thank you for your patience and love. I really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to hanging out with you in the next episode.